question and um, thank you for staying after the pizza. Um, do appreciate that. Um, so we're going to be talking to you today about inclusive design through the lens of multi-sensory UX. Uh, so it's just something a little bit different, um, a kind of departure from screens. Um, thank you. Um, just to introduce us, so my name's Ruby. Um, bit of background about me, I uh, actually studied graphic design um, and then sort of when I left I realised I had a real passion for understanding people and learning about how um, you know design might help them so I kind of changed career path and went into product design, uh, physical and digital and, and uh, product innovation um, which is how I kind of ended up at Smart Design and I'm going to hand you over to Nate. Thanks Ruby. Um, hi everybody, my name is Nate. Um, just a little bit about me, where I come from. So I'm originally trained, actually originally as an architect, and then as a physical product designer. Um, but over the past 13 years, I've been working with Smart Design to design both physical products, digital products, and services. Um, and so, uh, just a little bit about Smart Design and why we think this particular talk is so important. So Smart Design is one of the older uh, consultancies out there. We're turning 40 years old this year, this summer. And um, Smart Design is founded in a physical product design sense, and from the very beginning, being user-centered and incorporating user-centered um, processes was uh, what the value proposition of the studio was known for. Um, currently, the types of projects, when we think about UX, um, we do think about digital screens, we think about uh, apps and webs, but we also think beyond that. Um, we, in the recent projects, uh, we've been working both on product as service, delivery systems for Ford, um, whether it be like a social uh, setting for Sephora, or some physical platforms for PepsiCo or physical platforms for OXO. User experience for us is um, a very multi-sensory, a very multi-disciplinary concept. And so uh, through that, we have a number of core tenets that we try to push through all the projects. So, uh, inclusive design is in our DNA, and I'll cross this way so Ruby feel a bit more comfortable. Um, so, inclusive design is in our DNA, and one of the core stories that we tend to tell uh, to introduce the idea of inclusive design starts with uh, these two folks here. So, this is Sam Farber and his lovely wife Betsy. And about 30 years ago, um, Sam Farber is, uh, has a long career in kitchen product design, and his wife Betsy was about uh, retirement age. And she was making an apple tart in her kitchen, and Sam watched her wife, his wife, struggle uh, in peeling the apples for the uh, for the apple tart. And this was really strange for Sam because he had spent his entire career designing and manufacturing products for the kitchen. And the culprit was this one right here. So who has had or used one of these products specifically? So a couple, of, yeah, a couple of you have maybe used this maybe at your nan's house, uh, maybe you might have one still in your kitchen. But this was the culprit. And why was that? This is a very uh, unconsidered design. No one really, I couldn't tell you who designed this. I don't even know how old this design is. I mean, these are the places where inclusivity can really make a major impact. So Sam looked at this and said, well, how, how can I design a product that's not just for my wife, who happens to have rheumatoid arthritis? So if you think about a, an arc of inclusivity, uh, his wife might be at the left. But he didn't want to just make a product that was maybe for a specialist shop or for an inclusive or uh, disabled product line, we wanted to create something that would be actually attractive also for professional chefs, such as Emerald there on the left. And so hence, Smart Design and Sam Farber came together to found uh, OXO as a brand and start creating uh, a movement of products that embrace universal design. And so with the core tenet that if you design for one end and the other end of the spectrum, you'll automatically capture all the people in between. So that's a little bit of the of the foundation and the um, fundamentals I'd like to present. Uh, in doing so, just to remind you in terms of what that means, the, when we prototype these products, it's not just about making it really comfortable and really easy to use for the person that has disabilities. It was also about making the knives as sharp as possible, making sure that the professional and the high-end users are as satisfied as well. And so, this is the end result. You've probably all seen this product. Um, it's probably the only vegetable peeler in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and it becomes a foundation for many different products. So this is a lens that I want to put on a number of different projects that we have coming up. Um, first, uh, the stories that we're sharing are actually come from a consortium between Smart Design and the BBC2 program Big Life Fix, 
which was a documentary program on TV uh, where designers came together to try to solve people in need through the design process. So with that, I'll hand our first story back to Ruby. Thank you. Um, just out of interest, did anyone see Big Life Fix? Okay, that's not bad. Um, yeah, like Mike said, um, smart design really has um, inclusive design in its DNA. It's actually the reason that I wanted to come and work at Smart in the first place, um, because the value is so closely aligned with my own. Um, the first, um, wrong way. So the first uh, case study that we want to um, present to you today is uh, this, it's Playground. So you can kind of imagine this as the uh, potato peeler at the beginning of the OXO story, but here we are going to start in the playground, and we're going to start with, uh, instead of Betsy, uh, little Josh. So Josh um, is eight years old, and he is completely blind. He's profoundly blind, which means that he has no light perception whatsoever. Um, so he came to uh, Big Life Fix, um, well his mother came to the show because she was concerned about what was happening to him at school. So Josh goes to a mainstream school, um, his parents wanted that for him, and he has um, a teaching assistant that will go with him from class to class uh, and enable him to keep up with the things that are happening in the classroom. But the problem is the playground. As a completely uh, blind child in a playground full of sighted children, um, you can probably imagine how difficult that is for him. And what has, what has been happening is that he just is excluded from play altogether. Um, he goes very into, in sort of um, insular, um, he sort of puts his headphones on and he's listening to his music and he is sitting at the edge of the playground or sometimes actually just won't even go outside. Now, the, the challenge that was kind of presented at the beginning of this was how can we have Josh play in the playground with his other friends? Um, I'm sure you can probably um, imagine, but let me just paint the picture for you even further. Um, the playground was much like the potato peeler, probably not really designed, had been, not been designed for a long time. And it's just sort of some tarmac, and in this case, uh, quite old tarmac, which meant that the ground was really uneven, there was lots of things to trip over, and the children were sort of running in every which direction uh, to sort of make their fun. Um, as part of the process, I was actually taken into the playground with a blindfold on as a kind of empathy tool to sort of to understand, and it was really very distressing because you can't really tell where something is going to come from or how it's going to hit you because the sound um, is very disorientating. So, the, the design team went off and thought, right, how are we going to fix this for Josh? How are we going to make him uh, feel confident and play in the playground? And we brainstormed loads of ideas um, and looked also into the industry to see um, where we might be able to take some inspiration. Uh, one of the things we came across are these, these are goggles designed by Microsoft that actually scan um, a, an area and start to use image recognition to uh, sort of read back what it, what the goggles can see, so it might say, you know, restaurant, lamppost, whatever, so that the person who can't see is able to sort of see. So, sort of inspired by that, we thought, okay, if we can help Josh understand where he is in the playground, then maybe he'll start to feel confident. And the first thing that we did was uh, cover, this is a, a diagram of the playground here, we covered all um, the kind of essential spots with uh, Bluetooth beacons, and we coded an app to read when, the, uh, when you're walking over one of the beacons with a sort of tag that was like an audio landmark of where you are in the playground. The idea being, a little bit like the goggles, that you would be able to walk through the playground and it would say, you're at the swings, you're here, you're this. But what we realised in doing so, by uh, creating, by sort of um, tackling the problem in this way, is that we weren't designing inclusively at all. We were trying to sort of change Josh to fit his environment rather than create an inclusive experience for all. Um, and that was when we sort of had to stop and go back to the drawing board and think, what do we need to do? What we realised we needed to do was understand the, what, the children, what all the children needed from the playground. And one of those things is um, kind of freedom and imaginative play. 
um, when we were in the playground sort of watching the children just doing what they wanted, you know, they're constantly changing how they use the space. You know, one day the tree stump in the middle of the tarmac will be the castle that they've got to all run to because everything else is lava. The next time it's, you know, they're all police people and they've got to, and it's, you know, they are, the whole point of play is creativity and imagination. And so that was something that we realised that we needed to incorporate into what we were designing um, for all the children, including Josh. So we still knew we needed to, to navigate Josh, so one of the other things that we um, sort of drew upon was um, this guidance paving. Um, you might be familiar with it, it's seen in uh, many sort of um, street crossings and stations and parks and things like that. Um, there is actually a code that goes with this kind of paving, so as you can see, um, when you stand on it, you can feel it underfoot, and the ones with the kind of dots on them mean stop, it means there's a hazard and you need to, um, maybe there's a crossing or, or something like that. Um, and the lozenges, um, if they're in a straight line, they also mean stop, but if they're in a kind of, if you're following along them, they mean follow this way. And we thought, right, we can use this. And what we did is we created a, a kind of road system in the playground that would allow um, Josh to navigate his way around. So what you can't see in this diagram is um, where all the numbers are, are actually um, different points in the playground. So um, along this side there's all sorts of um, there's swings, there's a slide and things like that. There's an astroturf. Um, 14 is just the corner of the playground, but that's actually something that the children will use in their games. And it now means that Josh can, um, can find it. The other thing that we did was to enable uh, a, a sort of a greater understanding of where he was. Um, we added sound to the, the tiles that, are, um, that have the, the raised dots. So here and here are um, tiles that have dots. And they are each, each road that leads to the crossroads is actually assigned a sound. So one of them was bird song, one of them was uh, whale sound, and there were all these different animal sounds that meant that um, Josh was able to learn that bird song road leads to, in, well, the, actually the, the entrance and exit of the playground, etc., etc. But what was really critical is that instead of having these sounds so that only Josh could um, hear them, we had them built into speakers so that all the children could hear them and they could all play and make games out of them. Um, yeah, it's uh, worth mentioning that this was all done in about six months um, and we sort of had come up with this quite elaborate plan that involved digging up the playground. Um, thankfully, when you were doing something with the BBC, and this was actually the Children in Need special, um, we had many volunteers, um, in this case Mace um, Construction Company, to help us actually build the playground, which was really magical. Um, and this is the end result. So um, you can see the, um, the paving, um, guiding paving that leads to the crossroads, and it goes to all these different places, and actually those posts all have speakers on them. Um, and then the time, it was the moment of truth of to let Josh uh, into the playground for him to play um, with his friends. And I think one of the most wonderful things was standing there with his parents and his dad actually said, I've lost sight of Josh, I don't even know where he is because he blended in so much with the other children that he was just one of the crowd. And because it was such a sort of um, kind of visual thing, the other children understood that if Josh fell off one of the, um, one of the roads, they would kind of help him back onto it and so he always knew where he was. Um, the sounds and the roads were deliberately there to be a kind of um, a very free framework for play. And so the children were playing with it in ways that we hadn't even imagined. So, you know, one of them was like, there was a, a guitar sound and one of the children was just jumping up and down and it pretending to be a rock star. Um, we did put some Easter eggs in there as well. So if um, enough children stand on every single one of the ends of the roads and all jump up and down at the same time, it would cheer. Um, so they, would, um, they were sort of figuring things out um, like that for themselves. Um, but it really, um, for us at Smart Design, feel, we feel this really embodies the kind of real principles of inclusive design, which is, you know, take two ends of the extremes, in this case, you know, a, a non-sighted child and sighted children, 
and design for both of their criteria to come up with a better solution for, for all. So just to continue that theme, um, so this gets a little bit more digital, this next project. Um, this is uh, focusing on voice control. And before we get into the story, uh, just a show of hands, how many people have something like this in their house, either Google or, okay, that's maybe about half. So that's pretty good. That's kind of what we expected at an event like this. Um, even if the US population is still about 25% of households have a, um, have a digital speaker that is AI connected. But while the other projects that we talked about started with a very un unconsidered and old project, this project starts with something that's quite new, but still somewhat unconsidered. Um, so each of these stories has had a hero, and the hero of this story is Susan. So Susan's 67 years old, and she happens to have multiple sclerosis, and she's had that for a number of decades. Uh, multiple sclerosis uh, is a neurological disorder that prevents you from having full control over your body. And so she has extreme difficulty in mobility, she has to use a special chair, she actually has difficulty using the controls that you see here, she can't sit up on her own, uh, and she has a lot of difficulty doing the things that you might consider every day to, in order to live an independent life, such as uh, changing the TV, turning on the lights, uh, list, re responding to a phone call. From a UX perspective, from an input perspective, this is pretty much her limit, physically. Her limit is usually just to hit one button. And her home is actually surrounded by accessibility solutions, um, such as this. This is called a possum. It's quite similar to the system that uh, Stephen Hawking has, actually. Uh, it basically rotates through options, highlighting them, and waiting for you to wait until the, hot, the item that you want is highlighted and then hit the button. Um, as you can imagine, that's not a very uh, efficient system and very tiring. And so as a result, she just ignores it altogether. And so, uh, Susan actually has two carers that has to visit her four times a day in order to get through daily life. Now, back to this guy over here. Um, obviously, as a bunch of young, digitally savvy, savvy designers into this home, you might think, oh, well, this is really easy to solve. Voice control uh, is a great way to solve all these things. You can do the TV, you can do the lights, you can do phones. Done. Job done. Um, now, what's challenging is that we brought some of these, uh, we brought an Alexa, we brought a Google, um, brought it to Susan, put it in front of her, and just kind of unguided let her have a go. And as you can imagine, um, these things are quite rigid in how you're meant to talk to them. Um, and it's quite opaque what you can do with them. And so if you haven't used one, let alone someone who doesn't own a smartphone and can't imagine what Siri can do, can't imagine what Cortana can do, this is a very difficult experience. And what was the most heartbreaking is that in this experience, Susan started to blame herself. She actually said, oh, you brought this amazing technology to me, thank you so much, but I'm just not, I, I'm stupid, I can't, I'm not smart enough to do this product. And that is horrible. That is actually when product design really needs to stand up. Because it's not because she's stupid, this design is stupid, just to be fair. And, <laughs> So just to be, if there's any uh, Amazon people in the room, we did give this talk at Amazon, and um, yeah, they joked along as well. Um, so let's go back. So why is this a challenge for Susan? So a little bit more about multiple sclerosis. Um, obviously, it has a as a neurological disorder has a major impact on your physical body, but it also has an uh, impact on your mind as well. Now Susan is super intelligent. She's really smart. She can tell stories. She's lively. She has a great sense of humor. But once in a while, she has what she calls a, fo a foggy moment. And to be honest, I think we've all experienced foggy moments. And sometimes even walking up to one of those uh, Alexas. Have you ever walked up to an Alexa, knowing exactly what you want to do? Start to talk to her, and then as she lists responds, you kind of stutter and forget exactly the right phrase, and then by that time she's forgotten and she's moved on. We've all experienced these foggy moments. And so that again is a major barrier to her being able to navigate such a UX. And so, here's a little metaphor that we came up with in terms of the, the current state of design for UI. Um, it felt a lot like, having seen this experience through her eyes, not through the eyes of ourselves, that this UI, this voice UI, was a lot like a really snooty waiter, waiter at a, a, maybe a restaurant with a long French wine list, and when he comes up to you, uh, you don't have the wine menu, but he's still looking for you to sell him exactly what wine you want, and you also have to pronounce it quite right as well. So, 
this is a pretty major challenge. And what we wanted to do is flip that. We need to change uh, that level of interaction. And so in order to do so, we actually came up with three approaches that actually have been talked upon a little bit by uh, David and his talk, um, and Francesca as well, about how can we make voice UI more inclusive. So the first one is about that opacity. There is so much to do and we really need to personalize the content. It might probably no surprise to anyone in this room that there are about 20,000 and counting different skills on Alexa. And that's more than anyone can keep track of. Let alone someone who hasn't ever been inter uh, interfaced with something like this. And so our challenge in order to take everything that it could do and make it clear that what it should do for her um, was to actually personalize it for her. Not unlike Spotify. So Spotify's done a great job and it was a place with the same problem. All the music in the world, but have you ever walked up to Spotify or maybe a not Spotify music app and think, oh, I know exactly what I want to play and then just freeze in that moment. And Spotify has overcome that. Spotify has daily playlists that are based on your behavior and can suggest something even when you don't quite know what you want. So our goal, just to go back to the metaphor, was to take that snooty waiter at the French restaurant um, and make it more like the happy guy at the pub down the street. So maybe he's seen you come in a couple times, and he knows that when you come in on a Friday, it's either going to be the fish and chips or the steak and egg pot. So, with that metaphor, going back to uh, an actual UX challenge of a voice UI, we knew that we can take all the things that are, and I should also mention this project was done in four weeks. And so instead of using like actual AI and algorithms, we really had to fake it, be a bit happy, and to actually just interview her and ask her what do you do on a regular basis and say, okay, those are now your personalized functions. And in doing so, we needed to categorize those functions so that instead of thinking about all the things she could do, we can start with a high level hierarchy. So we could ask her, do you want to listen to something? Do you want to watch something? Or do you want to talk to someone? And with those three options, that became the beginning of a road to get into more complicated options. And then within those options, we could say, okay, if you want to watch something, because we know you, and we're playing the role of uh, manual AI, we can say we can either do BBC2, uh, ITV, or Channel 5. So this is our first step in terms of making this uh, opaque uh, UX more inclusive to really personalize the content. But then there was the challenge of those foggy moments. How does she get through this very, even at this level, fairly complicated uh, infra infrastructure? So to do that, it was really about semiotics. And in this case, using audio semiotics. Um, so many of you are probably familiar. So semiotics is the study of symbols, and what do those symbols mean to people. Symbols are a way to give feedback to let them know where they are. Um, a great case study that I love to use because it's frustrating so much before they fix it, uh, was when these bikes were all blue. Do you remember when they were blue? Um, and the Barclay bikes, they, had, they still have these little pads, and if you were a foreigner like me using a credit card, you had to push in a six-digit code into those buttons, and those buttons had no feedback at all. It didn't even, it, there was no lights, there was no sound, it didn't even click, it didn't even like, move. So what you'd find is these bikes were like, people had used their keys and carved the numbers into the side to try to get in, and when Santa Derek came in and realized that there was such a problem with semiotics, they obviously fixed it with lights and sounds as they should. So, to go back to my story about the voice UI for Susan. Sorry, a bit of a tie right there. Um, so when Susan is going to communicate, what we found is that sometimes she might be in the middle of a flow and kind of forget where she is. And so what we had to do was kind of reinforce where she was going at every step. So when we said, what do you want to do today? Do you want to listen to something, watch something, or talk to someone? She could, if she said, I'd like to watch something, then we can say, okay, let's watch some TV. So would you like to watch ITV, BBC2, ITV3? So again, reinforcing those steps so that she realized and remembered where she is. And again, this is for her, but this is something that um, is really key in any flow. The third point for making the voice UI more inclusive was to really humanize the technology. Now this is brand new technology, so maybe it goes uh, without saying that it isn't quite found its form factor yet, but um, there's nothing about this that says you should talk to it at all. Other than maybe a couple speaker grill holes, it's really just a strange, odd cylinder in your house. And when you present it to someone, the idea of talking to a strange, odd cylinder in your house is quite foreign. We, many of us have gotten used to it, but it's still a step. 
And if you really think about this, um, the way something presents itself can really affect how you interact, just, just visually. So, who recognizes this guy? Cover. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hal from 2001 Space Odyssey. So this is a lot like Alexa right now. And I think uh, Amazon eventually started to kind of soften her look. But still, it's this intense uh, stare, this like blank object. And it's very foreign to talk to these things. So imagine how you would talk to Hal, or maybe not talk to Hal if he's a bit intimidating for you. Now if we change the interface to something like this, would you talk differently? Would you talk to it more frequently? Would you forgive it if it made a mistake? So this is a different way to present work and uh, to present voice UI. And so we knew that we had to humanize this technology. We had to give it a body. We had to uh, literally give it something so that she was talking to an entity that was uh, more relatable. Now we had to look for some clues. Um, sniffing around her house, we realized that there was one animal above all that she was particularly fond of. I mean, it took a lot of sleuthing. We had to look high and low in all the corners, but eventually we put all the clues together, we got some post-it notes, and we figured out she really loves owls. Um, she used to be in the Girl Guides when she was young, and owls is the uh, mascot for that. And so, easy, job done, we've got our system. So, without any further ado, fast forward four weeks, we present to you Susan's voice UI. Looks something like this. So you see, the voice UI is now a character. It's something you actually talk to. The owl is designed with a fairly friendly shape, um, and it can communicate both with voice and with color. So effectively what it's doing, in some regards, is just amplifying what the engineers at Amazon have already done in terms of the light control. Uh, when it's listening, it turns blue. When it's playing music, it turns purple. Um, but even when you're not talking to it, we added a little bit of breathing so that when you look across the room, it reminds her that it's alive and that you can talk to it, which is very important. Little behind the scenes peek as to how we did this, guys. So this is the hackiest job ever. Again, you have to forgive us. This was four weeks of work for the sake of television. Um, but I think it's a, the Amazon team gave us good props for getting around some of their challenges. The, the thing is that uh, with Alexa, you can't have one um, skill, tell another skill what to do. And so that really kind of tied our hands because we wanted to have, we wanted to design a conversation skill um, that was for interface and then had it do other things. And so to get around that, we just got two uh, Alexas and we had one to be the skill that talked to Susan and that had the, con that had the conversation design that we had. And then once it finished the conversation with Susan, it would whisper to the other Amazon guy and say, okay, Alexa, turn on BBC2, and that's how we got away with that. So uh, Amazon's working on it. Um, so again, just to reiterate for the third time, um, what was really interesting about this project is that, and this project and the others that we've shared with you today, it wasn't just adding on an accessibility feature or a layer. These products started with an accessibility challenge. They started in, by being inspired by people who really had challenging abilities. And then at the same time, how do we respect them and not just create something that's like for a accessibility shop or a particular product line, but how can we consider people on the other end of the spectrum? Because all who uh, in this room would prefer a voice UI, maybe those who had that Alexa already, that had a little bit more of a personality, that had a audio semiotics to guide you through, that kind of sorted out some of the options and presented them to you. Is, are those helpful things for other people as well? Great. So, a couple key takeaways. We knew that coming into this talk, it was going to be a bit of a sidebar um, to show three projects that had no screens at UX Crunch. So I appreciate your patience and your ability to span your uh, imagination to make a metaphor. All of these products, again, weren't just considering these people, they were inspired by these people. This was user number one, and then think about the user at the other end and solve around that. It's a very different way to approach design. And 
while these were products that were inspired by that from the very beginning, even if you're working on a particular feature, uh, you can think about how you start with this space. Because when we start by being inspired by these people, we can create things that solve problems for her. I think I really appreciate, I think it was Dave that showed that we're all disabled at some point, in a temporary way, in a non-temporary way, um, in a static way. You know, whether it be dexterity, you're carrying too many things. Whether it be uh, visibility, you're wearing your sunglasses at night. Or uh, cognitively, you're just trying to make your way down the streets of London. We're all in these positions. But we don't think about it. We have to use these heroes to inspire a better story. And as a result, we get products that are really great to grip when everyone's hands are wet and slippery in the kitchen. We get new uh, playgrounds that inspire all the kids to think about a new way to play. And we get a slightly more friendly and less rude voice UI. I'd like to share that as our story today. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be here for questions.